This video is made in partnership with Moft. I've been using the iPhone 15 Pro for the past couple of weeks. I've played with the action button, used the USB-C for several things, tested the cameras, and paid attention to the battery life. I even ordered my very first Pro Max model ever because I wanted to try the 5x optical zoom and see if the battery life and screen real estate is worth the sacrifice in size. So I spent 2 weeks with the iPhone 15 Pro and 2 weeks with the iPhone 15 Pro Max and I'm finally ready to share my 30 day review as well as my decision on which one to keep. More on that later. After 2 weeks of using the iPhone 15 Pro, I can confidently say that the switch to titanium was the right call. The natural titanium is so beautiful, the matte frame feels nice to interact with, and it's something I appreciate every time I'm using my phone. It's less prone to fingerprints, and the lightly rounded edges really enhances the experience of holding the phone without the case. And not to mention, this switch makes the iPhone 15 Pro the lightest Pro model ever. It is about 10% lighter than my 14 Pro, and the difference is actually noticeable. Every time I pick up my phone, it feels comfortable to hold. It's not too heavy that it causes fatigue, but it's also not too light that it feels cheap. It feels just right. Although the screen size remained the same, the bezels are thinner because the overall body shrunk by a tiny bit. It's pretty subtle, but I do notice it. However, if you're planning on using your phone with a case, then you might not notice this change as much. I chose not to install a screen protector for my 15 Pro since my 14 Pro held up pretty well without one. I'm pretty careful with my phone so I'm not really worried about scratches and so far so good. If you're not convinced, take a look at my wife's 14 Pro. It looks pretty good and she's admittedly not as careful as I am. The titanium frame also looks as good as new, no scratches just yet. And if you're curious how dings and scratches would look on natural titanium, here's one from my Apple Watch Ultra, which I barely notice and see unless I'm switching my bands. If you're worried about it, you can always get a case and I suggest getting one that complements the phones well so it doesn't take away from the premium experience, especially since these phones aren't cheap. My phone case of choice is this one from Moth. This case is made from their very own Movast vegan leather and it's one of the best vegan and non-vegan leather case I've ever used. It has a really nice texture, it's soft and it feels really nice in the hand. It gives enough protection without the bulk and the buttons are solid and tactile which is super satisfying to press. In the past month that I've used it, it hasn't shown any signs of wear and tear. It's so easy to clean, it's scratch resistant and it has maintained its beautiful misty cove color. And of course, there are other colors to choose from. The magnets are also extra strong which is important since I use a ton of MagSafe accessories to enhance my daily iPhone use like this phone stand and wallet which has been a permanent fixture on my phone since the iPhone 12 Pro. And most recently, I've integrated the Snap Phone tripod stand in my daily use. I use it in the theater angle to consume content, I use it in the video call angle for meetings, and I even use it as a tripod for different kinds of filming. It's so useful and the possibilities are endless. Because it's so thin and compact, I always carry it with me wherever I go which allows me to be ready to work or create anytime and anywhere. If you are ready to elevate your iPhone experience, check out these Moth accessories by using the link below and don't forget to apply the code JOHN10 to enjoy a 10% discount. The iPhone 15 Pro feels snappy, opening and switching between apps feel much smoother, and doing everyday tasks is a breeze. What makes a huge difference is Pro Motion. Before the iPhone 14 Pro, I really didn't care much for a 120Hz display, but now it has really changed the game for me. It's kind of a blessing and a curse in the sense that you really won't know what you're missing until you experience it. However, once you do, you can never go back. I haven't noticed any significant benefits from the A17 Pro chip. Playing 2K and COD Mobile on my iPhone 14 Pro was already smooth and the experience with the iPhone 15 Pro was no different. I am looking forward to playing Assassin's Creed Mirage when it comes out. Having a full-on console game in a small device like this is absolutely insane and if it lives up to the hype, it could make iPhones an even compelling purchase. It's already a great phone, it has a great camera, and it now potentially could be a very capable handheld gaming device. Let's wait and see how this turns out though. I hope running these kinds of games won't cause any overheating issues because that would be a real bummer. Speaking of overheating, I didn't really experience the level of overheating other people were experiencing, but I noticed that my iPhone 14 Pro did heat up significantly after updating to iOS 17, which made me think that the overheating problem was due to a software issue so I wasn't really concerned about it. And after the iOS 
iOS 17.0.3 update, it's now a thing of the past. One thing I was really excited to explore was the action button. I leave my phone on mute most of the time, so I was intrigued by the potential of this addition. Initially, I had it set to basic functions. I played with flashlight, camera, focus mode, voice memo, and although those were great, having it set to a single action made it so it's only useful in certain situations. So then I started looking into shortcuts, something that I really haven't utilized before and my mind was blown. It's pretty awesome. Obviously, shortcuts isn't exclusive to the iPhone 15 Pro, but the action button is, and that's what takes this to the next level. I watched several videos about it, and there were two creators who helped me figure out my setup, Stefan Robles and Proper Honest Tech. I learned to use shortcuts in conjunction with focus modes, which opened a whole layer of functionality to what I thought would be a forgettable action button. With one long press, I can do different things depending on my focus mode. When I have it set to driving, it automatically types a text to my wife sharing my ETA. When I'm on filming mode, it opens up Notion so I can look at my script. When I'm on sleep mode, it turns on flash flashlight, and when I have no focus mode, it brings up a list of actions I had set. There are more useful shortcuts out there. I've seen some pretty cool HomeKit shortcuts, and it's making me want to invest in HomeKit accessories so I can take advantage of them. Thankfully, as a lefty, I find the position of the action button really accessible. It sits right within the reach of my thumb. It's just perfect. I do wish Apple would expand on the usability of the action button. Right now, you can only use it with one long press, which is good to eliminate accidental presses. However, I still want the option to assign different functions for a short press, double click, triple click, I think that would really take things up a notch. Another thing I was excited for was USB-C, and let me say this clearly, I am glad to have USB-C on the iPhones, but after a day or two, I thought to myself, now what? It didn't really improve my iPhone experience as much as I had hoped. My wife still uses an iPhone 14 Pro, so we still have a lightning cable everywhere in the house. I have a second gen AirPods Pro that uses the lightning cable. I know people have been using an SSD to film 60 frames per second log footage, but I don't think I'll be doing that that much, especially since I have two other cameras that I would much rather use for filming. One thing I've used the USB-C port for is connecting it to a portable monitor, and I think this is where the potential is. Right now, you can use a monitor or a portable monitor for watching content, gaming, video editing, presenting for work. But what I would like to see is stylus or touch support when using a capable monitor. For example, I use this app called Trace for my architecture work. When I plug in my iPhone 15 Pro to my portable monitor, I can't interact with it using my fingers or a stylus. Having a stylus support would be game changing because then I wouldn't need to have or bring an iPad with me to be able to work efficiently. This could also be helpful for photo editing, sketching, or even simply signing documents. Of course, it would be awesome if Apple allowed the iPhones to act like an iPad when plugged into a monitor, kind of like what Samsung is doing with DeX, but I honestly don't think Apple would do that as that would affect their sales. So this is at least a compromise. This would allow for an iPad-like experience while still being limited to the iOS version of the app. Another thing that needs to be talked about is battery life. It's not great, but it's acceptable enough for my everyday use. I usually have about three to four hours of screen time on my phone. This particular day, it was slightly busier, so I had three hours and 45 minutes. I started at 100% at 8.45 a.m., and it was dropping around 18 to 22% every three hours. That's me going on Instagram, taking photos and videos, making phone calls, and so on and so forth. At around 6 p.m., I updated my apps, about 80 plus of them, which made the battery drop faster. But even at that, I had 19% at 8 p.m., which was when I eventually decided to charge my phone. Some days, my usage is a little bit less like this one Saturday. My phone stayed at 38% in a span of 24 hours. So it's decent for everyday use, but if and when I'm traveling or I just have a busier day, I'll most likely bring a power bank to extend the battery life. After two weeks, I switched to the iPhone 15 Pro Max and the size felt overwhelming. Using it with one hand requires a bit more effort. Accessing the control center requires some hand gymnastics. Reaching the other end of the screen is a bit of a stretch. And obviously, it is a bit heavier. I immediately thought, oh no, this isn't for me. But I was determined to give it a full two weeks before making any decisions. And I'm glad I did. 
After three days or so, I started to get used to the size of the Pro Max. In some instances, I would forget that I'm holding a bigger phone, and I think that speaks to the lighter weight and slightly reduced width of the phone. In fact, it's only 9% heavier than the 14 Pro, which is pretty light considering its size. Surprisingly, putting it in my pockets hasn't been a problem, whether I'm wearing shorts, pants, or even in my jacket pockets, it hasn't been a big deal. I actually thought this was going to be the deal breaker for me, but it wasn't even an issue. Being a longtime regular Pro user, the battery life on the Pro Max felt like a huge upgrade. The phone would last me the entire day, no problem, and there were even a few times when I forgot to charge it overnight, but I was still able to confidently use it in the morning before eventually charging it. And that's probably the biggest benefit I got from the Pro Max. Don't get me wrong, the bigger display is nice too. It's great for web browsing, responding to emails, doing some work, consuming content, but there's no game-changing multitasking feature that makes the most out of the bigger screen. So although I enjoyed having the bigger screen, I didn't need it, especially since I have other devices that can do specific tasks better. I have my MacBook Pro for doing deep work, I can use my iPad for a better viewing experience, and I have my Steam Deck or ROG Ally for gaming. The Pro Max didn't offer me anything valuable other than the extra battery life, which comes at the cost of giving up the size and form factor of the the 15 Pro, which I absolutely love. And this brings me to the cameras. The 15 Pro and Pro Max cameras are amazing. It's great for taking everyday photos and videos. You know you're going to get sharp, color accurate photos with decent dynamic range straight out of the cameras. So I went around Anchorage to take some photos and videos with the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max. And I also brought an iPhone 12 Pro with me so we can compare the camera quality and appreciate the improvements. At 1x, the first thing you'll notice is the difference in color and contrast. In this photo, the overall color of the 15 Pro just looks so much better and you don't need to zoom in to appreciate the difference here. Of course, you can edit the 12 Pro photo to get it close to the 15 Pros, but when you are taking multiple photos, that really adds up. When you zoom in, you can really see how much better the 15 Pros are in retaining details. You can see the wood grain clean and clear on the 15 Pro, while the details on the 12 Pro are a little bit soft and in some cases, you lose out on them. I also took a picture of my space with the sunlight coming through and you can see a more balanced image from the 15 Pro. The highlighted grains of the speakers are more defined and even the leaves look more lively. It's just a better photo overall. At 3x, you'll notice the same pattern. The 15 Pro was able to capture the scene accurately, the wood grain, individual grass strands, and even homes in the background are more defined. The 12 Pro takes almost like a washed out image. It has a bit more of a blue magenta tint, and the details are super soft. Meanwhile, the 15 Pro Max captures a more contrasty and warmer image. There is no doubt that the 15 Pro is the clear winner here, but I can't really decide which is better between the 15 Pro Max and the 12 Pro. I think the 15 Pro Max has a better image out of the camera, but the 12 Pro might be better for editing as it's a bit more flat. So not quite enough to capture the sheep, but you can kind of tell, right? At 5x, the image on the 15 Pro and 15 Pro Max are very close. I can't really see much of a difference, especially when looking at the photo as a whole. But when you start to zoom in, you can see the 15 Pro Max was able to retain a bit more details. The wood grain looks better, but the difference is not that big. Meanwhile, the 12 Pro took a flatter image with really soft details. And I was very surprised with this result. The difference between the Pro and the Pro Max at 5x is closer than the difference between the Pro and the Pro Max at 3x. In this 5x photo, you can tell the 15 Pro Max clearly has a better image, but the 15 Pro is not that far behind. In fact, the image still looks really great and it's miles ahead of the 12 Pro. In contrast, when you look at the 3x image, the iPhone 15 Pro clearly takes the better photo, while the 15 Pro Max is kind of close to the 12 Pro in my opinion. When it comes to video, the ProRes log is very exciting. I played with it a bit and took some indoor and outdoor shots, and it's definitely a game changer, especially for those who want to start creating using their phones. Capturing in ProRes log gives you so much flexibility when it comes to color grading. I mean, just look at how these clips turned out. They don't look like iPhone clips at all. Personally, I don't see myself utilizing this a whole lot, but I think it's great to have in my toolbox when I need it to get a unique angle for my videos 
or maybe even for vlogging. During my 30 days of testing, I found that I missed having the 3X more than I missed having the 5X. I'm not always walking around Anchorage taking pictures, I haven't traveled since my son was born, and the 3X is simply more useful in my everyday life. For example, if I want to take pictures in my home office, the 5X just zooms way too much. I found that I could always step closer to the subject while taking a step back isn't always an option. And just like I shared earlier, the quality difference at 5X is not that huge in my testing. So I'd rather have the ability to take 3X photos, which I do more often, and sacrifice the few 5X photos that I take. Next year, I wish both iPhones can do 3X and 5X, but this is where we are right now. I got the 15 Pro Max with the intention of keeping it. I thought that once I tried the 5X, surely I would love it and it would be hard for me to let go. But surprisingly, it had the opposite effect. It made me realize that the 3X fits my needs better and the form factor of the 15 Pro allows the action button to be in a more accessible location and I use that thing a lot. And I think if you are a long time regular Pro user and you have been wanting a bigger screen, a better battery life, and you know the five times optical zoom will be useful for you, I think this is a great time to make the switch. Had I benefited more from those upgrades, I probably would have fully switched as I truly enjoyed using the Pro Max for two weeks. But that was simply not the case and that's why I'm sticking to the iPhone 15 Pro. As for my friends using an iPhone 12 Pro or older, I think the 15 Pro or Pro Max is a worthy upgrade. I'm not saying you should, only you can decide for yourself, but I think there's enough upgrades for you to enjoy. You are getting the ProMotion display, which makes the experience so smooth, always on display if you are into that. You get the dynamic island, which feels more alive this time around, the new action button, which is super useful if you embrace it, and huge camera upgrades. You are getting a 48 megapixel main camera, there's also the new depth control for portraits, 3X or 5X optical zoom, ProRes log, and if it lives up to the hype, an A17 Pro chip to run those console-like games. The iPhone 15 Pro is the best iPhone ever, not because it's mind-blowing, but because it's polished. It feels so refined, and that's something that keeps coming to mind during the past month of using it. If you guys made it this far into the video, type in polished in the comments below, and let me know your thoughts on the iPhone 15 Pros. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you loved it, subscribe to the channel. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.